Welcome. Uh, and by way of introduction, my name is Ross Dix, and I'm a senior manager in our national manufacturing team here at RSM Australia. RSM is a trusted partner of the Robotics Australia Group, and I'm pleased to have the opportunity to spend the next hour with you all hosting this excellent panel. For reference, RSM deals a lot with the manufacturing sector, as well as helping export businesses in terms of international tax, R&D, and a traditional suite of accounting services. More importantly, what we're here to talk about today, robotics and the opportunity for Australia to position itself as a centre of excellence for the robotics manufacturing sector globally. Robotics will impact every sector of the Australian economy and has the potential to achieve enormous social and environmental good. Creating robotic technologies will lead to the jobs of the future through creating new possibilities. Pick and place robots used commonly in logistics, warehousing, manufacturing, agriculture, retail and other sectors are the workhorses of the robotics sector. They've evolved from industrial robots to cobots, and now even sometimes are mobile. While traditionally the manufacturing of these robots has been booming offshore, we now have a few companies in Australia developing this type of robot and leading the way here in Australia. So the webinar. This webinar for Robotics Australia Group is going to explore the phenomenon of pick and place robots and explore why Australia is largely a passive consumer of these technologies and how we can define our role as value creators. What is required to build a homegrown global company that can export pick and place robots and robotics related technologies to the world? Well, our panelists will give us an interesting insight. Our panelists represent a range of homegrown hybrid companies developing or providing integration services for, par for foreign pick and place robots. At our update webinar in January, we had almost 600 people register and 330 people join us online from the robotics community with 360 views of the recording so far. We believe there is a growing appetite for the nation to learn and be educated around robotics and the opportunities that that presents for the robotics sector in Australia. So a little bit of background about the Robotics Australia Group. The Robotics Australia Group is the peak body for robotics in Australia, representing the creators of robotics and robotics related technologies, integrators, users, research, educators and enthusiasts. The organisation was formed in May 2020 as a not-for-profit company to facilitate the growth of a sustainable and internationally competitive national robotics industry. So now, more importantly, on to what we're here to, to do. Um, the, the format is going to be, we're going to allow five minutes for each of the panellists to kind of introduce themselves and their organisations, what pick and place robots mean to them and where they feel the opportunities lie. Then we'll move on to the panel part of our discussion. Uh, a reminder that throughout the uh, throughout the webinar, you can drop your kind of questions into the Q and A box, and these are going to be weaved into the discussion this morning. So, without further delay, we'll go through. As you can see on your screens, we've got some excellent panelists. So, in no particular order, what we'll do is we'll go through each one at a time, five minute window to to kind of give a bit of bit of a spiel around what you and your organisation do, what the pick and place robots mean, and where you feel the opportunities lie. And on that we'll introduce our first panelist, Adam Toe from Dorobot. Morning, Adam. Morning, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, loud and clear. Awesome. Uh, so yeah, I work at a company called Dorobot. Uh, for those that haven't heard of us, uh, we're headquartered in Shenzhen, China, uh, and we've got offices in uh, Guangzhou and Atlanta in the US uh, and Brizzy, Australia. Um, so I'm heading up our uh, team in Brisbane, a uh, pretty small team at the moment, um, about four full-time employees. Um, and I started the, the Brisbane office in 2018 after uh, moving to Shenzhen the year prior uh, to join the team in Shenzhen back when that was the only office that we had. Um, at the moment, Dorobot has about 250 employees globally, um, and we're kind of targeting the whole world over in terms of trying to get our robots uh, deployed everywhere. Uh, so me personally, I've been working on pick and place robots for my entire career as a roboticist, um, which is uh, for about the last six years. Um, that started in uh, when I was undertaking a PhD, which I didn't finish, um, but at QUT in the robotics lab there uh, and participated in the Amazon Robotics Challenge in 2016 and 17. Um, so after that, that was where I actually met people from Dorobot um, and joined the team uh, straight out of the Amazon challenge. Uh, and since then, I've worked on 
uh, a few different pick and place uh, robots uh, within Dorobot. Dorobot does a bunch of different things. Uh, we have uh, a whole suite of mobile robots developed by our team in Guangzhou. Um, and then in terms of pick and place, uh, we're kind of tackling all the traditional um, tasks in terms of uh, logistics and warehouse. Um, so uh, palletizing, like mixed depalletizing, um, palletizing, depalletizing all the variants, um, one called repalletizing, which is just moving product from one pallet to another. Um, then we're also in terms of research and development work, been working for quite a while on tasks surrounding uh, we call it trailer like shipping container, loose load, unload and load. Um, they're longer term uh, aspirations um, as they're quite difficult problems. Um, and then a whole host of other uh, things. There's like a little bit that we've dabbled in in terms of tasks like the Amazon challenge. Um, and yeah, so within Australia, the really cool thing about the team here is we're not just like a sales office, we are doing um, both um, core research and uh, productizing and deploying, um, well, working on deploying at the moment at least. Um, and in terms of what I see for Australia, uh, the, I think the opportunities for robotics is, is massive here. Um, one, I think uh, we lose a lot of our talent. Like I know from going through uh, robotics at QT that a lot of the, my cohort left the country to get jobs. Um, and me personally, I was really lucky to be able to, um, I also left the country, right? But then I was lucky enough to be able to come back and start something here and then hire more people. Um, so I hope that more people that have done their studies here and have left will start coming back and starting either their own companies or, um, or joining the ones that are here um, and just growing and growing this industry. Um, and of course, I think robotics is going to be something that means that it can become financially viable for businesses to do more stuff onshore. Um, so I hope that we're part of making that a reality. That's it for me. Thanks for that, Adam. That was great insight. And we're going to move on to uh, Leopold, Man After My Own Heart with Right Robotics. Obviously, I'm based in regional New South Wales myself, so anything close to the border I'm fond of. So Leopold, if you could give us your introduction about what the organisation and what you think the opportunities lie and what pick and place robots mean to you and your organization that'd be great yeah sure thanks uh thanks for having me so um yeah so i'm from right robotics so our vision is really to automate orchards uh and pick and place is a, is a core part of that so you know the problem is really that you know there's like 800 billion apples picked by hand every year around the world um you know there's trillions of pieces of fruit and you know it's a very manual task it's been very difficult to automate in the past uh so almost all of it is you know people just picking it off a tree and putting it into a bin uh or or a little bag that they put into a bin so there's a lot of touch points um and it results in a lot of damage for growers uh which results in you know loss of revenue for them so we're really trying to automate this process and bring the technology that has sort of been developed in warehousing and logistics over time um, and take all the lessons from that and apply it in a sector that is really devoid of, um, of digitization. So agriculture overall is, is one of the least digitized industries out of any of them. Um, and so I think the challenges we've had to face are, are really trying to develop technology that's able to navigate uh, complex environments uh, and there's a whole lot of new challenges that, that get imposed when you move something outside of the warehouse into a, into a physical environment um, and, and actually develop something that's, that's meaningful for the grower as well. Uh, so the opportunities I see, I, I see a range in agriculture. Uh, there's definitely a lot. So for harvesting, you know, being able to selectively harvest fruit uh, and, and pick it off a tree and put it into a, a conveyor system being able to you know, pick weeds or, or other objects or thin tasks and, and things like that. Uh, there's a whole range of things that you can, you can automate. So when I've thought about, I've, ne I've never really like considered us to be like a traditional pick and place system because we are obviously trying to actually maneuver in a, in a more complex environment. And I think it's interesting to actually think about how you delineate between traditional pick and place, you know, sort of SMTs and, 
and, and those sort of systems that are in warehouses and those new types of uh, more dynamic systems where you have pick and place technology on a movable object uh, and you're navigating a complex environment. So I think, yeah, I'm interested to sort of talk a bit more about opportunities, but I think uh, agriculture is a huge one. Uh, there's a lot in, uh, in other areas of logistics and warehouses and things like that. Um, and there's also other opportunities to develop uh, core competencies across the, the actual system itself from like perception and vision to intelligence and, and other areas. So, yeah. Thanks, Leopold. And so pertinent at the moment, obviously, in regional areas, not just in Australia, but in the across the those fruit picking in terms of housing shortages and labor shortages so kind of a, a an example of how robotics is doing good for that wider social function uh thanks for that uh next up nicole nicole robinson from lyra robotics i'm really looking forward to hearing all about your organization so if you could give us a bit of an insight and, and what the pick and place robots mean to you and, and where those opportunities lie that'd be great Thanks, Ross. Great to be here. I'm Dr. Nicole Robinson, a co-founder of Lyra Robotics. Lyra was founded a couple of years ago with some members of the Australian Centre for Robotic Vision. At the time, a lot of work had been done on grasping and manipulation, and there was a lot of strong appetite to see how this could be moved into the commercialisation pathway and turn it into a sustainable business right here in Australia. So we have offices in Brisbane and Melbourne. Uh, we have received uh, venture capital funding as part of our uh, building our business. And our specific area that we're looking into is everything that can be done with human hands. So more around uh, picking fruit, uh, different kinds of objects that you would have if you're fulfilling some type of e-commerce um, order and things that are um, yeah, a part of the order fulfillment uh, supply chain in this case. So for us, it's been a really exciting opportunity to be able to take what has appeared to be a really clear um, evolution of research in both uh, perception, uh, learning, uh, robotics to a point where we can develop these types of products and be able to release them out into the world and into industry. So for pick and place, I think there's such fantastic opportunity because should the foundation be there for the technology, there are adaptations that can be made that can support a wide range of industries, especially those that are of priorities in Australia and worldwide. It's a fantastic opportunity to have a lot of those uh, capabilities here in Australia and to be able to uh, support local businesses and to build up our national capacity in these areas. So for... Uh, in place in the future. I think this is such a fantastic decade to be in to see where all these exciting opportunities are going to be taking us. Thanks, Nicole. And obviously anything that helps automate that supply chain and, and feeds into that Australian made narrative is, is really exciting. So thanks for your insights there. Now we, we kind of move to a, a slightly more international flavor. Apologies, Jason. I, I couldn't quite gather from your LinkedIn whether you're in Las Vegas or in Queensland. So Either either, if, uh, obviously with your most recent experience with Haddington Dynamics, looking forward to hearing about your experiences, your insights and, and what pick and place robots mean to you and, and where you feel the, the industry is heading. Jason. Yeah, no, no, thanks mate. Um, I actually am in uh, Las Vegas now. I don't know hotel room, but I'm staying at the Rio Casino right now. I'm only here until uh, uh, next next week, but I've uh, just recently come over here. So yeah, my experience, in robotics um, has been the last uh, three or so years. I, I came via you know, engineering and 3D printers and I ended up working with a company called Haddington Dynamics um, as a little startup based in Vegas. Um, part of my initiative to be part of that. And, and, and so Haddington, I should explain first, um, designed a pretty unique six axis cobalt, um, which was largely 3D printed using high strength 3D printers. And we were able to manufacture them, um, not only here in Vegas um, and California in, in micro factories, but um, also a micro factory called Decisive in Toowoomba. So we're actually making them across the world um, simultaneously using the same sort of common plan. Um, subsequently, uh, just over a year and a bit ago, we were purchased by the Ocado Group. 
Um, now that's when the pick and place <laughs> bit comes in. So a cardo group for those who those don't know, um, have a extremely efficient system of um, packing groceries. They can put uh, 50 items together via their dense on-grid robot system in about five minutes. So the idea of being able to just um, streamline that process of, of just picking a list of groceries um, and being able to deliver them quickly within a couple of hours is something that they pioneered in, in London. Um, first, uh, it's an English company. Um, they've more recently um, hit the States with uh, starting to create their dense systems, their dense factory systems, or on-grid robot systems here for Kroger, which is one of the leading sort of supermarkets here. And shortly to open, I think 2023, um, we're going to have two of our on-grid uh, big warehouse logistics systems set up in Sydney and Melbourne, and they'll be uh, they'll be supplying for uh, for the Colts Group. So, um, yeah, the, it's it's pick and place on a pretty grand scale. Um, we they have you know over I think ten thousand SKUs that they're actually sorting via um, via via like a, a tote system. So to, you know we're able, we're able to create some sort of consistency in the delivery by creating a standard size, but like the, the shipping container sort of theory of creating a standard size tote and everything, the whole grid and the whole packing system revolves around that standard system. Um, I actually left <laughs> the Ocado group at the end of last year. Um, it was very amicable, um, but um, you know, the, uh, the chance to actually get back into my entrepreneurial <laughs> um, skill was was something that I really wanted to to take up. So as of uh, December last year, I did leave. And um, because of my good relationship with Haddington, I'm continuing to to do work with them. But also, I'm, I'm here at the moment, um, you know, evaluating a couple of um, options for, for, for uh, food production using pick and place um, with uh, with my colleague, my new colleague uh, Bob Christopher, who is also online here, and and he'll give you some further insights into the world of of American uh, the remote, of American robotics system. Uh, we were actually introduced by Andrew Kate, actually Sue's sister. So we, you know, we're all in the family here. But certainly, you're right. There's a lot of Australians over here, and and we certainly want to bring that 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 knowledge base that's accumulated from not only our universities and the experience. That the Australians get in this amazing dynamic landscape we have in America, to be able to trickle that back to Australia and to create some efficiencies over there. So, um, I'm I'm a hustler, <laughs> ready to create those efficiencies. So uh, I'll pass on to the next. That's me. Thanks, Jason. A nice Ocado is a, a familiar name. Uh, we used to have our Ocado order when we lived in the UK. So it's like a it's like a warm hug from home. So thank, good to hear about that. Uh, oh yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> so next, obviously, next, as Jason's alluded to, we've got Bob Christopher, who's a senior director of innovation at Diamond Ventures, uh, based in California. So that's pretty exciting. I've just watched the uh, the, the series Super Pumped, where it's all about Cupertino. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, to hearing some insights uh, about mm. what you're doing and and the uh, and the Californian weather. Bob. Yeah, nice to meet. You. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet everybody. Thanks for the uh, introduction. So I've been building robots for 20 years. Um, I started back with a company called Ugobi, and we made a robot called Pleo, which is a lifelike robot. We uh, invented the technology that made robots behave and move lifelike. So we were really fixated on the motion control systems of robots and how to create organic movement that was expressive of motions and behaviors. And we did that, we called Life OS, and we raised $25 million and we built and sold and we've already sold 1.6 million robots so far. So I think next to the Roomba vacuum cleaner, I think the Plio is one of the most, one of the most, I guess, sold robots around. Um, I did that, and then I kind of, then I started a company called AnyBots with um, a bunch of people. We did telepresence robots. We actually, we actually did that at a Y Combinator in uh, California. Um, and that was a telepresence and that was all about um, navigation stack. Um, and then I helped launch a robot called Jibo, which is um, 
Professor Cynthia Brazil, who is the, the pioneer of social robots at MIT Media Lab. Um, I and her worked on a robot called um, Jibo, and we launched that. And then um, I've been helping a number of robot companies since then. Um, so last, uh, gosh, eight or nine years, um, I came to Panasonic and I helped them launch or stand up the robot division in California out of Cupertino. Um, I worked on robots for all their all the business units. So I was director of innovation and robotics for uh, four years there. So I learned of the Japanese, how they think about robots and what they need them to do. And now I'm at Mitsubishi Chemical. I'm on the innovation and investment side, but I'm also working on the automation side. So um, I pulled in a group called Stanford Research Institute, SRI, to work with me on helping automate one of our factories in, in Japan. And that just concluded like last month. So it was a two year project. And um, it, part of it was picking. It was not packing, but it was picking. Picking, manipulating and cutting. So it's a very complicated process where you had to pick a polyester film with a static adhesion, which is SRI's, one of their, one of their uh, patents is around static adhesion grippers. So we had, we used static adhesion gripper to grab the polyester film, pull it off the line cut it with a cutter and hand it to a worker. So complicated. And it was a big, dangerous job. So um, we solved some pretty big problems with that. So when I've, you know, I've recently was in the mix. I mean, that was my project. And uh, we're now doing a different automation project in uh, Fukuoka in our, in our silicate plant. And um, yeah, I, I just, I work with a lot of robot startup companies and I've, um, I've helped got some funded and I've helped um, build out their teams, and I, I understand what it takes to build robot companies. So um, I'm here to help you guys to bring robotics to Australia and see if we can collaborate. So nice to meet everybody. Thanks, Bob. And what's great to see is that we look across the panel before we go into the discussion. We have the breadth of technical expertise through to those like yourself, Bob, who have commercialized those products and, and actually understanding there's a combination of the technical issues and those barrier to entry around making Australian robotics manufacturing competitive from a financial perspective. So what we'll do now is we'll move on to a, the panel discussion that will last 15 to 20 minutes. And, and I'll encourage, I'll, I'll start with a, a panelist, I'll ask it directly towards them. I'd encourage people to, to you know, j jump in uh, respectfully and, and talk through and, and, and work through kind of their opinion. Right? So the first question kind of we've got which has come through is, is so in terms of pick and place robotics, the perception is that it's booming in the logistics sector. Where do, uh, and we'll start with, we'll, we'll start, Bob, we'll, we'll start with you just because you're the, the last one we've spoken to. Where do you see the opportunities uh, in that logistics sector go into for pick and place robots? And, and how's that going to integrate with say some human labor capital challenges? Is it, are you asking me? Yes, yeah, if you okay, can start. Okay. Um, yeah, I think it's a big market. I mean, I, you know, it's, there's a lot to, there's a lot to unpack there. There's a lot of things to think about in logistics and manipulation. So I think Nicole was talking about grippers. And so we also look at soft robotics as an area of interest for our company, Mitsubishi Chemical, um, because we, we obviously develop advanced polymers for, and um, for mountain making, we're actually making soft robotic material for manipulators. So that's an area that we're interested in. And I know other robot, like right hand robotics um, is doing some interesting things in that space out of Boston. Um, so I think it comes down, I mean, it comes down to a lot of it comes down to vision, vision systems. So, um, you know, tagging data, uh, running ML engines to know, you know, what you're, what you're looking at and, and developing uh, really intelligence around objects. Um, there's a company, I think it's in Germany that's doing this now, that's using stereo vision and object tagging to identify an object. And it's able to then adjust the, the weight and the um, torque of the hand based upon the perceived weight and volume mass of the, um, of the object. These are the kind of things that I think are really gonna become quite interesting because you can think about picking bananas versus picking something else. You're gonna to have to be able to adapt the end of factor to, to manipulate those things. And it's also then as it come down to the vision system to know where it's at in space 
and how to manipulate it. So those are like, in my mind, that's like the, that's the fun stuff. That gets, that's where it gets messy. But when the messy part is where you get the hack and create some really cool tech. And so I, I, I built a stereo camera and a, and a time of flight camera system at Panasonic. So I'm really into depth perception and object detection. So I, I, like, I like those areas. So my long-winded answer to your question. Yeah, thanks. And, and Nicole, would, would you be able to kind of provide some of your insights around it? I think the, uh, the integration and the role that it's going to play in the logistics industry going forward? Yeah, it's definitely a very critical one. When you think about it, everything we do with our hands is the basis of a lot of work that we do. So if you're managing to crack the idea of picking different kinds of objects up, manipulating it and using it in some way, that is the foundation of a lot of different types of work, whether it's manipulating um, certain tools, whether it's manipulating items for filling orders, anything along these lines. So once you have this, you're really creating a very strong foundation for having robotics to enable and accelerate a lot of different industries. I think that's where a lot of the excitement is going to come from, especially with, um, I guess, a lot of fine motor movements and things around this space. It's just for some quite a, quite a challenge. So once we, I guess, have this, this is going to be the opportunity to then see, I think, rapid gains from robotics in different industries. But I think in the logistics space, you know, you're dealing with things that are in known locations. You're dealing with things that are not requiring a lot of these, I guess, higher complex decision making. So I guess now that we've got to this part, it's really exciting to get to the next phase and hopefully unlock a whole variety of opportunities uh, for pick and place robots in the future. So maybe they're not specifically called pick and place, but that uh, foundational technology then becomes a different style of robot that is moving into um, other areas along that supply chain, either maybe before what was traditionally the pick and place robots and assisting with tasks after it as well. Yeah, that's a really interesting insight. And, and if we pivot from logistics into agriculture, uh, Leopold and Adam, what do you think that role, obviously traditionally Australia imports most of its robots, do you think there's a, a particular avenue of opportunity in this ag space given our prominent you know, agricultural sector and the use of pick and place robots helping with the fact that there are obviously labor shortages in some of these areas as well. So Adam or Leopold, if you could mm. jump in and provide your insights and then we'll go to the other one. Yeah, sure. I, I guess for, yeah, for agriculture, I think there's certainly a lot of uh, opportunities there. Um, so as I mentioned before, it's, it's like one of the least digitized industries overall. Uh, you know, traditionally very hard to, to automate when you're out in an area where you don't have much network connectivity and things. So definitely for fruit picking, I think there's a massive opportunity because uh, almost all manual. But you've also like upstream got a lot of opportunities uh, in, you know, identifying different uh, objects on the tree and, and doing the analytics around that as you're picking fruit. Um, and then also a lot of the warehouses and things like that within the agricultural space is still... Uh, very manual so doing the, the sorting and, and different things like that uh, and packing there's a lot of uh, applications for existing logistical uh, robots warehouse robots uh, to be applied there um, but I, I think yeah certainly in agriculture there's there's so many areas that if you think of uh, planting fruit uh, like planting trees uh, picking things out of the ground moving things from one place to another uh, there's just a whole lot of tasks that you can automate uh, and severe labor shortages every year, basically, you know, we're reading the news and seeing that there's uh, people who don't want to go out and pick fruit uh, or they want to do it for a very low price or something. Um, and, and that results in a lot of waste. So there's huge value in just being able to actually prevent that, uh, those, that produce from going bad. A great export opportunity there because I know it's an issue that we have in the UK as well around mm. kind of the different fees that schemes for fruit picking so adam your kind of kind of insights in, in which industry in particular logistics ag that uh, you think that you see the most opportunity playing out and, and your box kind of position on that uh so in terms of importing industrial robots i guess just to unpack that um i think in in terms of what we're actually importing a lot is it's just actuators um 
just because like we're buying industrial arms from overseas and that they're manufactured overseas i don't think there's any issue with that um it's no different from buying uh, a, a set of motors and um tying them together with some metal um from overseas i think the important thing is the intelligence layer on top of that um and if that can be developed in australia that's where the really really interesting stuff is um i don't know if it matters that much i mean it would be cool if we could have the entire uh chain here but it probably doesn't make sense exactly um but then in terms of uh the opportunities for robots in logistics here i think one thing that's really i found interesting recently um that isn't so much talked about in terms of unsolved problems um is how the safety landscape is in australia versus elsewhere in the world and how that plays out in terms of when you're trying to deploy industrial robots here um, or even cobots here um, and what our uh, legislative requirements are as roboticists or as even importers of um, these systems to Australia is versus our, those requirements elsewhere in the world. Um, and another thing uh, that I think is really interesting that I hadn't thought about before um, earlier, like back when I was at uni, um, I feel like we always think that um, the robots will sell themselves. Um, and I've definitely found that that's not the case. Um, especially right now, the challenge is that the robots that we're all building are not, even though they can do some tasks, they can't do all the tasks that a person uh, would often do in a, in a particular position. So just because you're developing a robot that can do something um, doesn't mean that a company is able to reduce headcount or expand with less headcount, which is often the case. Um, and so I think the real challenge is understanding and finding the pockets um, within these industries where robots with their limited capabilities right now can be of benefit um, while we're still working on the really challenging things that are currently unsolved. Um, and even in terms of unsolved problems with like vision, I always thought the problem with vision was just like being able to detect items, but um, a really difficult thing is taking it further to go. Um, and for logistics and boxes in particular, which I always thought was really simple, is like um, detecting damaged items. And like, what is, a, like, you can say it's like, that's, I've detected that box of apples, that's a box of apples. But like, what does it mean for it to be damaged? Um, and then what should your robotic system do? in that case, so that it's not constantly just either saying, that's damaged, I can't handle it, human, come save me, or um, all the things surrounding that. Um, so I think those are the real, like some challenges that I hadn't thought about previously that have come to light uh, in recent years, um, that I think are the big ones for the moment. I'm so, I'm so relevant, not just to the pick and place robotics sector, I've got a number of clients that I've worked with the facility of intelligent fabrication about robotic welding. And the whole concept was, would it reduce headcount? Well, actually, it takes a fairly skilled person to, to operate it. So ironically, if that person's off, the robot doesn't actually operate. So it's kind of having that congruence between understanding what the, what the capability is and having the, the human capital behind it. Jason, really interested to hear your thoughts. Given you have that experience, you know, hopping between the, uh, between the US and Australia around what you kind of see as the kind of biggest barriers to entry for Australia being competitive in robotics manufacturing and what kind of technical challenges we have to overcome? Well, I, th I think, you know, um, we we're talking earlier about, um, yeah, robots don't um, don't sell themselves. <laughs> it's a very, very good point. It, there's um, obviously resistance to, to change, I think, is something that we unfortunately have in Australia. Um, a lot. We, 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 we tend to sort of look for solutions that are already mature before we, you know, engage in them. And that's a general statement, I know, but, but it seems to be true. Um, so, you know, this is, we need to engage the potential users on, on many levels. One of the things that I've been involved with is um, working on um, some robots as a service as a solution to implementation. So, you know, we, we, we need to be able to sort of um, 
you know, be able to sell the return on investment on these units, to be able to show that we can actually um, make the numbers, increase productivity for these solutions to be incorporated into a, into a corporation. So whether that just be a, 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 a simple structured, uh, well, not so simple, <laughs> nothing simple with robotics, but a, a structured pick and place, or, or you know, where we're going into these more unstructured environments where we're picking fruit off a tree or, or sorting out, um, you know, bin picking of, of, of returned stuff that's come from e-commerce. There's so many sort of elements to this that we're going to be ex expanding into. But certainly, um, when we're looking at the challenges we have ahead, um, we've, we've got, um, you know, increasing inflation and all these sorts of things. One of the bottom lines um, that I've heard a lot talked about is we need to increase productivity. And, and you know, while we while, while it's correct, there's a lot of technology isn't quite ready yet. It is getting to that mature stage where in the next two or three years, we're going to be implementing these solutions um, across the industry. So, you know, we need to be able to think creatively around this. We need to be able to engage um, industries in Australia to, to think a little bit differently. Uh, robots as a service is certainly one of those things, one of those challenges. I'm also working increasingly with, you know, the idea of being able to um, use digital twins to not only just to be able to control the system and maintain the system, but also to sell it as well. <laughs> you know, we need to be able to show that, you know, the environment in its full sort of breadth can be, um, you know, we can work out the, the robot path planning and a, bu a bunch of different stuff before we even implement the technology. So, you know, there's a couple of things there, but just being able to properly communicate these ideas to companies that wouldn't automatically wake up in the morning and think, I need robots. <laughs> you know, we, we really need to take them on that journey to show them how they can use it. And that's a challenge. That's a, that's a big challenge. Thanks, Jason. And Jason, uh, Bob, you might be able to give me kind of a, a bit more of a, an understanding. Obviously, the Australian kind of tax regime has tried to now starting to incentivize the reinsuring of, uh, of IP and IP creation through the patent box and bits and pieces. But those regimes have been in the rest of the OECD for a long time now. What's the perception of the competitiveness from a kind of capability return on investment piece around having robotics actually manufacturing based in Australia, uh, and what are the main barriers to entry in, from that perspective? Uh, Jason, Bobby, if you could, any insights would be much appreciated. Yeah, yeah well, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll pick that up. I mean, yeah, I, I, but listen, we've got the talent in Australia. There's no doubt about that. Um, we, 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 we do have a very conservative investment <laughs> um, sort of structure in Australia, but I think those, those things are changing. You know, I... I, I it's a tricky thing. I'm, I'm in America <laughs> right now because of, you know, trying to sort of hustle some sort of good ideas. So I, 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 it's not an easy answer to try and solve the Australian problem <laughs> about our reluctance to take on technology. We, do, we certainly have the talent. Um, but I think, um, you know, I, I don't know, I'll throw this to Bob. But, yeah, he might uh, be and to... Bob, it'd be interesting <laughs> to hear because we've got three obviously excellent robotics companies, organizations, you know, on the call alone. And that's a reflection of, of the ecosystem here in Australia. If you look at it from a, an investor's perspective, uh, what are these, what are the barriers to saying, okay, we're gonna, you know, look to work with Lyra or Wright or, or Dora, but what kind of things are you thinking about to make that onshore in peace and build in the Australian capability from a, as an investor's perspective? Um, I guess my, well, okay, it's a big question. Um, I think, you know, I, I know what I know from here. I mean, how, how this world works, the robotics in Silicon Valley. So I'm actually in Silicon Valley right now. Um, there is pods and pockets of expertise. There's AI people, there's computer vision people, there's um, navigation stack people. Um, we have a lot of cross-pollination with the autonomous car market. So there's a lot of um, engineering talent that kind of goes back and forth. Um, for robotics here, like we have night scope and fetch and those kind of robots. So, um, to, you know, I think the same thing could be true for parts of Australia, big countries. So, I guess pick a pick a city and what's the what's the best place to invest in tech. And I'd be interested, kind of, in the fellow panelists here because I feel like we're we're all having one to one discussion. But I mean, everyone here is you know trying to build their company, raise money, um, you know. 
they're looking for talent. That's always a big challenge, like looking for really good talent. Um, so I think that's the crux of it all, getting good talent, good ideas, really good projects that can, you can demonstrate the value of robotics, that'll bring money in. And then, but you know, I'm not sitting in your, I'm not sitting in your city right now. So I'm not sitting there knowing like, what's, what are the dynamics? You know, what, what are investors like in Australia? So, um, so I'm, yeah. I'm not, I'm not so really interested in segue. If we, if we, if we, and thanks for that. If we go to Leopold, you, you're kind of on this journey at the moment around mm -hmm. trying to build your, your, your company, your brand, VC, trying to raise bits and pieces. What are your thoughts around this? And are, are there any perceived kind of barriers to entry in terms of the perception of technical capability of, of the robotics sector in Australia? Yeah, no, I, th I think we've certainly uh, had that experience. So we've raised sort of two smaller rounds so far. Um, and, you know, our experience has been, it's been quite challenging in the Australian market. Uh, the, it's, it's obviously a very small uh, group of uh, investors relative to the US. Uh, and I think a big part of it is there is a, I, I feel like a general perception um, or a fear of hardware overall. Uh, and robotics is an area which is obviously incredibly com complex. You're you're taking very sophisticated parts of technology and, and putting them in a physical environment in a way where there's a lot of risk factors. So the biggest thing is, you know, when we've talked to some of the, the bigger funds is really like, how do we prove that we're de-risking those critical elements? And it's in some ways, it's sort of chicken and egg thing because, you know, you need to prove out the customer side of things and show there's demand that we've been able to build you know, a significant waiting list. We've been able to demonstrate uh, signed contracts with growers and things like that. Um, but then actually going, okay, well, we're developing the, the actual core technology and showing that path of progression because it's not something that just happens overnight. You've got to iterate. Uh, there's a lot of learning in R&D that, that you've got to prove. And I think trying to translate that story simply to um, some VCs who may not be at all experienced with, you know, investing in hardware companies can be quite a challenge. So I think the big advantage that you have, I think particularly in like the US and San Francisco Bay Area, uh, and even in places like China, is I think there's this very uh, there's this very targeted funds that are well equipped to to understand and invest in these particular industries. Um, and there's also this sort of very strong collaboration between the research institutes, uh, the startup companies, big corporates and government to you know, really uh, identify key target areas uh, that need investment and, and help do that. And I think in Australia, we, we've got that to a certain extent, like we've relied, actually our investors, our lead investors were from New Zealand, uh, just some angels. And we also had uh, government grants, which have supplemented uh, pretty much all the investment we've had. We've had more money from grants and things, uh, which has been great, but it also shows that there is sort of this, uh, this lack of, um, uh, I guess, uh, informed capital potentially, uh, and 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 I guess a lack of infrastructure around uh, understanding that. And you know, we've also, as you've been talking about, Jason, uh, that the um, robotics as a service, trying to find out new ways and new business models where we can apply that to an industry to to get more of that adoption and, and show that demand curve side side of things as well. Um, so yeah, no. I have a question for you on the on the funding side. Sorry, Leah, but I just yeah. Uh, Question is, uh, do you see a lot of Chinese money coming into Australia? And I'm thinking about from the CM side. So Foxconn was my biggest investor in my company, um, but I noticed a lot of the Chinese CMs come here to California to, mm -hmm. and also Boston to really cherry pick a robot technology they can bring back to China and do things with. And I just, like we have a group, well, I was a mentor at a group called Highway One in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And the whole thing was bringing hardware companies to Shenzhen and boot camping them there, getting them all set up in manufacturing and then coming back to US and raising money. Mm -hmm. So, um, but they're always leveraging, they're leveraging the, all the CMs that they had in China to make that argument why the people would want to invest in these companies because they have these, these, these kind of pre-built relationships Mm. taking a prototype to DFM process to manufacturing. I'm wondering, since you guys are a lot closer to Asia than mm. we are, and there's a lot of China money in Australia, I would think there's 
Chinese venture capital activity in this area in your in your, in your country? Yeah, it's, it, I mean, in my experience, it hasn't had I haven't seen a lot of uh, I guess Chinese venture capital uh, in particularly in this space. Um, but maybe that's just been my experience. Um, I think there definitely is a lot of investment in Australia. There's a lot of capital coming from China, um, but I feel that I mean they're probably a lot more advanced in some ways than than Australia. Um, so you know we've got certainly technology we're developing locally, like for our robot. Uh, we're, we're sort of looking at a sort of distributed manufacturing model where we, we build our robots in simple ways on site, like in, in farms and, and do different things and obviously com, uh, in, import the components we need to, to do that assembly. Um, but yeah, we, we haven't, I haven't uh, experienced a, a lot of uh, Chinese venture capital in Australia, but maybe some of the other panelists might have uh, views on that. Well, I'll, I'll quickly, I'll, I'll kind of, I'll come in on that in, in terms of, from our perspective, we're seeing the China practice group as the fastest growing part of RSM, Australia's mm. kind of kind of business line because of some of those trends that you're talking about. Um, mm. Seems to be particularly prominent in some of, uh, especially on, the, on that Sydney kind of traditional Sydney, mm. Melbourne kind of markets. Mindful of time, obviously we started a few minutes late. So what I'm keen to do is have everyone just wrap up for a minute about what they think the key opportunities, the key takeaways, something that they want to, talk about for, for around a minute and then, then we'll pass on to the Robotic Australia group to talk about some initiatives that they're going through but some great discussion and Nicole could you just kind of obviously with your kind of focus on that that human behavior piece what are your key takeaways what are your opportunities what are you thinking for that robotics you know manufacturing or the robotic sector in Australia going forward yeah, thanks, Ross. I think there is really good opportunity. I think there is fantastic talent. There's a really great uh, partnerships that can be made to help support Australian companies and entrepreneurs making it through uh, the phases of building and developing their companies as well, because not a lot of people in Australia have taken this right through sort of on their own in being able to establish themselves in Australia. So I think there could be some really nice uh, partnerships there to, I guess, coach and mentor uh, Australian businesses coming through. I think um, there's also important challenges in the international supply chain that are impacting on how some of these uh, pieces are coming into Australia, coming out of Australia, and that's creating a lot more uncertainty on being able to uh, work with customers with specific timelines. Uh, so hopefully in you know the year or two after COVID, it might settle down a little bit more, but I think that's something that also needs to be raised uh, as a potential challenge moving forward and how we'll be able to deal with this. I think, uh, as already mentioned, investment in robotics companies based in Australia or closely partnering with Australian capabilities uh, to be able to build something stronger here. There is great talent, but being able to translate that into uh, strong technical leadership uh, is a really important gap, as Adam had mentioned. A few uh, colleagues had already headed overseas to be able to make that uh, jump in their careers, and building that here would be really important for Australia. Oh, and sorry. mentioned, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. yeah, you go. No, um, just that reducing entry barriers for customers and connecting them to solutions as well would be my last points there. Thanks, Nicole. Thank you for your insights there. Adam, uh, any closing comments, your thoughts? Uh, closing problem um, that I'll just throw out there um, that I haven't seen a solution to yet is in terms of uh, manipulation, designing a gripper that uh, can handle boxes from like five by five by five centimeters up to maybe a meter by a meter by a meter. Um, or uh, and suitcases um, as well. Um, so imagine something that's able to handle like your 80 inch TVs down to tiny little boxes um, ranging from like 50 kilos down to five, like 100 grams um, and then suitcases as well, zero to 30 kilos. Um, people can do that. Um, and so far in terms of just challenges in robotics, I think that's a, a standard problem right now. Um, is gripper design um, that is able to come close to what people can do. Um, definitely an open problem. It's just like a thought experiment for everyone that's here. That's all for me. Thanks, Adam. And uh, Leopold? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, I think I think the opportunities, like 
there's a quite a few like with manipulation i i agree i think we, we've sort of had to design our own custom systems to to manipulate apples uh, you know it's reaching a very long distance with a very small amount of weight but we, we've found it really hard to find many uh, well like robotic arms that are, are suitable for that task so we've developed our own um, but you know end effectors uh, technology uh, is con continually improving uh, and vision and perception and intelligence uh, overall is, is there's going to be I think some really interesting developments so so a recent paper around Gato which is using a generalized intelligence system uh, to use robotic uh, end effectors to actually stack objects and it's trained on like 600 different tasks so we're going to probably see more of that generalizable technology come out. Um, but I think that, yeah, the big opportunities in, in Australia to really capture this, uh, you know, we're gonna have to really work on the talent piece, I think critical, like instead of having, you know, our best people go overseas, um, you know, being able to encourage them to stay here and, and start to build that ecosystem and community. Um, and also, you know, creating more awareness in the industry uh, by educating customers more about the benefits and. And you know, finding creative ways, like Jason mentioned, about informing them of what the value is, um, and then you know, finding new ways of addressing that value with new business models, um, and then you know, really just encouraging uh, you know the capital to be invested in this space because I think we all see that there's huge opportunities, a lot of value to be captured with robotics, um, and it's sort of translating that to to mechanisms that uh, you know traditional venture capitalists are more comfortable investing in. Um, and, and you know other forms of capital so I think that will help really accelerate this pace in Australia. Thanks Leopold that's great and that uh, Jason. Just follow up I, I, Leopold earlier mentioned about you know distributed manufacturing and that, that's something that's sort of close to my heart and you know starting the the micro factory like we did in, in Toowoomba and what's what's really good about that for Australia going forward is I, I you know I see us being able to um, create these um, little little pockets because we've got such a huge huge country that we can actually start to manufacture in medium to small volume bespoke stuff. Um, you know we haven't got the deep deep market, the huge market that they have here in the state. So we, we we're going to need a more adaptable market. Um, you know we specialize at Haddington and making using three D printers, and those were able to you know create most of that supply chain for the bomb list that we created the, the robot i think 180 of the parts out of the 250 part assembly was 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 made but what that gives you is the ability to be able to change sizes and adapt the robot for specific requirements and i think we're going to see more modular robots rather than just these fixed units coming onto the onto the market being able to you know Put them together there's a bunch of different systems out there that, that are embracing this more modular style of robotics and i think once we can do that a little bit more and that's a maturing market then it's going to give us you know more more leverage to be able to create robots in australia which i think is something that we sort of will you know need to do um but but you know going forward we we we've got a country with a lot of talent and yeah there is a brain drain like like everyone has mentioned and that is something that we need to circumvent. Uh, Bob and I recently caught up with uh, Trade Investment Queensland in San Francisco, you know, and I know, you know, there's more and more grants coming out. Um, we do need to increase our R&D investment in Australia, but I think there's, there seems to be a tide turning. I think those things have all been recognised, and I think um, there's a general spirit, and, you know, we've got a Robots Australia network, we've got a bunch of different bodies, the Arm Hub, and a bunch of different really, really good elements that are hopefully going to spur us on to sort of taking this more seriously as, a, as an industry. But, um, you know, we're not just about mining. <laughs> There's a lot more things we can do in Australia and we need to embrace that. So I'm hoping for the future where we do have our own robotics, you know, system that we can sort of export to the world somehow. But uh, maybe that's a dream. <laughs> Thanks, Jason. And, and your comments are particularly pertinent, I think, around that modular manufacturing piece. We, we've, we've embraced it particularly in that fabricated and welded metal space. And there's some yes. great products now going to the export market. You know, hopefully we can do that in in a robotics sphere. Uh, Bob, some final comments and, and then we'll pass on just for some closing remarks from uh, Robotics Australia Group. Um, sure. Happy to be here, guys. I'm not Australian, so I can't only say so much about your country, but I'll look to visit it someday. I mean, I, I've got a lot of things about robotics. I don't, I could talk for hours, you guys. I know, I mean, 
this 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 industry is such a it's so misunderstood and i think people don't appreciate what goes on in robotics they just think it's robots they don't realize the deep tech that goes on it um you know i one thing that my company mitsubishi chemicals looking at is robotics to um, help with recycling of materials and everything from sorting to um, it's it characterizing different things to then picking it up and and, re and separating things um we're yeah we're looking at a different technologies in that space so there's that's a big area for us. I know BASF has the same initiative as we do. So I, I think if there's places to kind of pick a fight or pick an opportunity to do, I look around sustainability and recycling as one of the areas to um, either downstream or even upstream. So feedstock coming in or um, waste stock coming out. But both ways, there's opportunities for robotics. That's great. Thanks, Bob. Uh, and thanks for everyone for the comments. And I think what's great to see is it kind of uh, it shows those advocacy aspects that the robotics australia group are particularly important for amongst this ecosystem and on that note i'll pass on to robotics australia group to, to talk about what the upcoming events they've got and um, some closing comments from themselves so um is it sue are you making the comments or is nicole uh is she... oh yes no it's me nicole yep. is in uh, is in the uk but thank you i'll keep it very short um uh, thank you ross for hosting today's webinar and thank you to our panelists adam bob uh leopold jason and nicole for for joining us today i think we really scratched the surface and there are so many more things that we could talk about. Uh, just very briefly, wanted to mention a uh, welcome to two of our new members of Robotics Australia Group, Jeevan Robotics and BIA5. And an invitation, um, if today wasn't enough for you, there will be a recording of this on our YouTube uh, channel that you'll be able to refresh your, your memory of today and, and get up to speed with Pick and Place Robots. Uh, and on the 14th of June, we're working with the Australian Academy of Technology and Engineering, and they have are running a series called Innovation Nation, and the focus will be on the robotics industry. So we'll be talking with Swarm Farm, Bionics Queensland, uh, we'll be talking about drones, and uh, so please keep an eye out. For, for that next event and apart from that thank you once again Ross and thank you to all our panelists um, for, for joining us and for, for giving everyone an insight into pick and place robots and I think how Australia can uh, find its own place in in that uh, particular type of robot thank you